history that is told to us by historians, uh, contemporary historians of the evangelists uh, and of, uh, of the apostles of, of Jesus himself. So uh, one thing that I, I thought would be very interesting to dive into would be the, uh, the backgrounds of uh, the guy who ended up ordering the execution of the greatest man born of woman, uh, namely John the Baptist. Uh, and this guy is named Herod. Uh, now, if uh, you've gone through the Gospels at all, you know that there are uh, quite a few people named Herod. Uh, there are, uh, in, in fact, they, they, uh, they uh, in, except in a couple of places, they often don't really seem to distinguish. It, it often seems as though Herod is basically this bad guy doing all of this bad stuff, right? Uh, which, they are, they're all pretty bad guys. Uh, you're, you're not far off in that estimation. Uh, however, they are different bad guys, uh, or, and, and different degrees of badness as well. Um, and so I thought it would be, it would be not only interesting, uh, but also uh, useful for our understanding of the Gospels, the background of the Gospels, to, uh, to take a little look into uh, the, what, what must have been in the, in the time of the Apostles, in the time of, in the, time of the Evangelists, uh, a rather well-known history. Right, a rather well-known genealogy, something that, in fact, the uh, not only the, uh, the ruling classes themselves were very concerned with, but the ruling classes were very concerned with uh, because it was well known among the people as well. Who was who? Who was whose son or daughter? Uh, and what, if any, rights that gave to them? Uh, especially, what if any rights that gave to them that that may may be said to have had uh, divine sanction? Uh, when it can't, when it comes to ruling God's people, when it comes to uh, making uh, making uh, treaties and alliances, and so on and so forth. So, uh, the way I've I've packaged this, uh, uh, perhaps a little too ambitiously, uh, since I think uh, are there any Bible scholars here in the room here? Uh, probably not, because any Bible scholar who saw my title would say. Eh. Know about that. Uh, the genealogies, I have no reason uh, to, uh, except for, for being rather bold, uh, I have no reason to, to suppose that uh, the gospel writers were writing the genealogies at the beginning of uh, Matthew and Luke's gospel uh, in, in contradistinction to the genealogy that we talked about tonight. Uh, but, it, but it does provide a, a little bit of food for thought. Uh, and, and there are, there do seem to be these uh, uh, perhaps more than connections here and there. So, as I point out here, uh, King Herod, as he's referred to in the Gospels, may refer to any of these four different guys. Uh, and, and actually, in addition to the Gospels, I include here the Acts of the Apostles. Um, Herod, Herod the Great uh, is perhaps uh, the Herod above all Herods, as his, as his surname uh, indicates. Um, but uh, he, in fact, is not the Herod who is at the, uh, the, the center of the action when it comes to John the Baptist. Uh, Herod the Great is the father of, and, and uh, as it turns out, the grandfather of all of the other Herods uh, that, that we will meet. And so I want to take us through uh, these Herods, uh, both backwards and forwards. Uh, uh, backwards, uh, actually mostly backwards and very little forwards, but uh, uh, to, to see what, uh, where, where they come from and, and how the, uh, the sort of, uh, the, 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 Persons of the drama are, are sort of laid out for us. So, uh, beginning with Herod the Great, because it's it's sort of uh, from and through Herod the Great that everybody flows here. Uh, he's the first guy that you you really need to, to have down. Uh, and Herod the Great uh, is uh, sort of the uh, this this linchpin for everything that that follows in the Gospels uh, as we as we have them. <clears throat> uh, and uh, a large part of it comes from uh, Herod's own genealogy, which, as it turns out, is going to be a very small part of the genealogy I'm talking about. <laughs> but, the, but the genealogy of, uh, of those who came before him in the kingship of Israel uh, conditions his own genealogy. It's, it's one that he himself even tried to lay claim to, uh, but which, uh, with, with, with varying degrees of success with, with different, uh, different groups in Israel. The key thing here is that he's the, the son of this guy named Antipater the Idumean. Hands up if you know where Idumea is. OK, 
Okay, good. All right, we've got some we've got some uh, geographers uh, amongst us. That, uh, this is good because uh, w when we're talking about uh, the uh, the Holy Land and uh, these these various um, you know regional uh, names that are attached to people, uh, this is the sort of stuff that kind of makes our eyes glaze over. But to the hearers of the gospel, uh, this is this is this stuff was was crucial. This stuff was was very important. So when I call uh, Herod the Idumean here. Uh, to, uh, or rather that he's the son of Antipater the Idumean. Uh, the, the Idumean part there is, is doing a lot of work uh, because as, uh, as you may recall from your, uh, from your reading of the book of Genesis, uh, this guy named Edom, from whom we get the, the term Idumea and, and Idumeans, uh, was, the, uh, was the, the, the brother on the short end of the stick uh, of, of, of a better, a more famous guy known as Jacob, or more famously known as Israel, uh, Edom or Esau, as he is known in the in the book of Genesis, is the one who sold his birthright to Israel uh, in order to, um, well, have dinner. That's uh, that's that's really what it came down to. His his, uh, his brother Jacob was a really good cook. And uh, Jacob had a stew on, and uh, Esau had come in from the hunt, was very hungry, and you know, in, in a kind of fit of passion, said, uh, I, "I will give anything in order to have this pot of stew." Uh, and Jacob, you know, a uh, very very shrewd kind of fellow, uh, uh, took this opportunity to to get the birthright, and later on would go about stealing the blessing from his father Isaac as well. Uh, so, but they, these, these stories, of course, are, are rather well known from, from Genesis. Uh, but immediately when we talk about uh, Herod the Great, the king of Israel, uh, uh, in fact, he's, the, he's among the first to, he, he is the first to have this, uh, the claim of being the king of the Jews from, uh, from the, the Roman government. Uh, the fact that he is the son of, of Antipater the Idumean uh, already tells you a lot about uh, how he was viewed in his own day, especially by uh, the people of Judah, the, uh, the, 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 uh, the, the population of Israel. <clears throat> um, so at first, he himself was, was designated a, a tetrarch uh, or, or a, a regional governor. Uh, and this is uh, perhaps a key part of the, the story that we'll get to later on. Uh, but Antipater, uh, whom we'll also get to later on, had uh, appointed him as in a kind of succession to take over part of his kingdom that he had, uh, that he had uh, obtained through his dalliance with the Romans. Uh, Herod the Great was, was very much known as a loyal ally of another fellow you may have heard of, Mark Antony, uh, of Antony and Cleopatra fame. Uh, Herod the, the Great... Um, <clears throat> Largely through the, the largesse of Mark Antony, who was, who was made uh, uh, almost a kind of emperor of the eastern half of the Roman Empire. Uh, Antony uh, was the one who, who really consolidated for Herod the Great a lot of his kingdom. Uh, in fact, uh, Herod would have been uh, a very uh, short blip on the radar screen were it not for uh, Mark Antony. Um, even after uh, Mark Antony suffers his demise, uh, famously in uh, the Antony and Cleopatra uh, 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 scene. Uh, Herod the Great, however, shows uh, a part of his greatness in his ability to preserve an alliance with the mortal enemy of, of Mark Antony, mm -hmm. namely Octavian Augustus, who comes to be known as Caesar Augustus. Um, and in uh, so uh, in in kind of true uh, Herodian fashion, what, what comes to be known as true Herodian fashion, uh, he manages to eliminate all of his rivals, uh, his own uh, family, his own brothers, uh, and, and so forth, and therefore becomes sort of king in his own right without any, without any contestants. So this is Herod the Great. This is, this is the guy that, uh, that, that, that basically becomes the focal point for the Gospels. This is the guy that is the backstory for the Gospels. Uh, for, for a number of reasons that we'll see as we go. But this is, this is sort of who he is, just a snapshot at the beginning. <clears throat> I want to take us more into the background behind Herod. Uh, not just who it is that he ends up, but who it is that he's trying to be. 
And what it is that he's trying to be is uh, this obscure, uh, a part of this obscure family, at least perhaps obscure to many of us, uh, known as the Hasmoneans. Anybody familiar with the uh, Hasmoneans? Okay, a little bit, yeah, a little bit here and there. Okay, good. Uh, you, if you have taken a, a uh, course in Second Temple Judaism, you're very familiar with the Hasmoneans. <laughs> Uh, and uh, I'm, I'm very sad to say that I'm, there, there are a lot of things I would love to talk about that could only fit into a course on Second Temple Judaism tonight. Uh, so I'm going to have to skip a lot of it. But uh, the Hasmoneans are, uh, we, we can say they're, they're really kind of the, the missing uh, link in the, in the Gospels, or, or rather in the, in the Bible, in the, in the narrative of the Bible. Uh, those of you who have done a, a Bible in, the, in a year reading, you try to go from, from start to finish, you'll notice that there's, uh, there's a lot of history there. And especially if you're very diligent about making the connections between uh, the prophets and the chronicles and the, the books of Kings and so on, you can catch a lot in there. Um, there's, uh, there's even several stories that, that take us through what it was like to, to be an Israelite in exile, in, in Babylon, uh, which, which occupied a, a small but important part of their history. And even there are books that, that narrate their return to Israel and the building of the, of the Second Temple, the so-called Second Temple. Um, but but uh, the, the, the last sort of thing that we, that we see uh, in, the, in the Old Testament is uh, the, the, the revolt by this group of uh, brothers and their father who come to be known as the Maccabees. And the Maccabees, uh, we, we, we basically get the sense at the end of, uh, of, the, of the books of the Maccabees that, you know, everything is hunky-dory and, and, you know, it's, it's happily ever after from this point. Um, but, it's, but it's really not. There's, there's a lot of drama and, and history that's going on uh, from this point, uh, from, the, from the end of the Maccabean Revolt uh, until, the, until the beginning of the Gospels, uh, until in the beginning was the Word. So... Uh, to, to refer to the Maccabees here uh, is to refer, I'm going to drop down to the bottom here, to refer to a, uh, uh, to a, a, a kind of popular name or a popular title uh, that was uh, given to uh, a family whose actual family name, uh, we're told by the historian Josephus, was actually something like Asamonaios, uh, what we've come to anglicize as Hasmoneans. Um, so the Hasmoneans uh, are this family uh, whose, uh, whose famous sons, uh, who are leading this sort of revolution against, uh, against oppression in, in Israel, uh, which we'll, we'll get into, uh, the, 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 the Maccabees uh, are, are just sort of accorded this name primarily actually through association with one of the brothers, uh, whose name is Judas, uh, Judas Maccabeus. Uh, is, is, is Judas the Hammer, or Judah the Hammer. And uh, he was particularly successful in, uh, in sort of depleting the resources and, and sapping the strength and the energy uh, of, uh, of the Seleucid army, of the Seleucid Empire. Um, <clears throat> before, of course, uh, the Seleucids, uh, we have, from the, from the time of the, of the return of, uh, of the, the exiles of Israel back to their land, uh, we have centuries of, of rule by both the Persian Empire, uh, if you remember Cyrus the Great, uh, he's referred to at several points in the Old Testament. Cyrus the Great is the emperor of the Persian Empire. Uh, he is uh, defeated, or, or uh, rather some of his descendants are defeated uh, centuries later by another guy, another great guy, uh, you may have heard of him as well, Alexander the Great, uh, who imposes rule across basically all of what was the Persian Empire, uh, including Israel, uh, including, uh, including the Kingdom of Judah. And, uh, and uh, uh, although Alexander the Great uh, spends very little time in Israel itself, the, uh, the generals who helped him in this conquest uh, all received different portions of uh, what was the Persian Empire. Now it was the Greek Empire. Uh, and the, one, one of the uh, generals that had received uh, this, this portion of, of, uh, of his kingdom, pretty much the, uh, the kingdom of the Fertile Crescent, uh, around, the, around the, the area of the Babylonians, the Phoenicians, the Syrians, 
uh, and uh, the Judeans uh, was a guy named Seleucus. And Seleucus uh, is the is sort of the, the father and the godfather of the of what will come to be known as the Seleucid Empire following. One of his descendants is the guy at the center of the action in the books of the Maccabees, uh, and that's a fellow named Antiochus IV. Uh, there were several Antiochuses, by the way. Uh, the father of Antiochus IV, known as Antiochus the Great. Uh, it's actually the founder of some of these cities that you may have also heard of, known as Antioch. Uh, and Antiochus is, uh, uh, is, is one of the, the major figures um, sort of uh, pushing back on, on Greek rule at this time, weakening their, uh, their power in the east, which actually la uh, leaves them open to attack from the west, and is a part of, uh, a part of what uh, uh, un unwittingly, by and large, aids the Roman conquest of the Greeks from the west, uh, western front. Antiochus IV uh, Epiphanes uh, is, uh, is one of these guys uh, who ends up on the, the other end of things. Uh, the Romans have, have completely washed through uh, the, uh, the, uh, what, what's left of the Greek Empire, uh, and Antiochus IV is, is now the one holding the bag. Uh, the, the Romans have essentially threatened uh, uh, the, uh, this, this uh, Babylonian and uh, Assyrian portion of, of the Greek Empire. And uh, uh, he is, uh, Antiochus IV is now, under, um, he's now under obligation to the Romans to begin paying uh, huge levies, huge taxes, uh, both in money as well as in mercenaries. And one of the things that he does in order to, uh, to supply his debt to the Romans uh, is he starts going around and raiding various temple treasuries, uh, including, although there wasn't much to the, the temple treasury in Jerusalem, uh, the, 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 uh, this second temple that had been rebuilt in Jerusalem. Um, that's never going to play well with anybody who is devoted to any time, by the way. And, then, and it's usually crazy kings who go about doing this, uh, raiding <laughs> temple treasuries uh, pretty much before their, their very rapid downfall, uh, and often in some kind of strange tragedy. Mm -hmm. um, Emperor Nero is actually one of those that does the same thing. So uh, Antiochus uh, IV is, uh, is the one who, who stands behind the, the rise of uh, the Maccabees, uh, the, the brothers Maccabee. And uh, it's recorded for us in the, uh, in the books of the Maccabees as primarily a religious revolution. Because in addition to raiding the temple treasuries, Antiochus was uh, was was sort of devoting himself to uh, to uh, uh, Greek religious practice, piety to the Greek gods, uh, including in Jerusalem, where uh, a, a statue of Zeus was erected uh, in the Jerusalem temple, and sacrifices were being offered uh, around Judea uh, to, uh, to 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 various uh, uh, Greek gods. And it's on the occasion of, of one of these uh, offerings to Greek gods that one of the, uh, the Judean priests is being forced into that uh, suddenly out of nowhere, uh, this guy named Mattathias uh, shows up and basically kills the priest who's offering this sacrifice to the Greek gods. I know, the, the poor priest, right? He's, he's in a hard position here. Um, but, uh, but this guy, Mattathias, uh, is, the, is the father of all of the sons who will lead the, the, the Maccabean revolt. Uh, he, is, he is the, uh, the father of the Maccabees. And uh, it's from this zeal, uh, from, the, from the zeal of his, uh, of his uh, 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 loyalty to, uh, to, the, to the honor of God, to the proper honor of God, to the proper honor of the, of the uh, the sacrifices due to God in his temple and, and in the land, and only in the temple, in the, in the land of Judah. It is his zeal for, for the Lord, uh, which is, uh, which is the, uh, the, the, the sort of foundation for, uh, for the righteousness of the, of the, of the Maccabean Revolution uh, that begins uh, about the year 167 or so. Um, <clears throat> And uh, three of the, uh, the more famous Maccabeans that uh, uh, we would have reference to here are uh, Mattathias, who I just talked about, uh, the one who slew the priest, 
uh, Judas or Judah Mac Judah, uh, yeah, Judas Maccabeus, who is uh, uh, a very successful sort of general uh, in the Maccabean Revolt, dies about 164, and uh, Jonathan Maccabeus, uh, who comes to be uh, sort of the uh, the link between the the revolution and the beginning of the Hasmonean dynasty. Jonathan, uh, interestingly, uh, is uh, in part because of his uh, his father's actions uh, in in, uh, in zeal for the Lord, but perhaps also because of some uh, kind of connection to to the uh, uh, to the priestly families of, of ancient Israel. Uh, he himself comes to be a uh, he, he he basically claims for himself the title of high priest uh, in Jerusalem. And uh, this had, even before the, the time of the Maccabees, already become kind of a political appointment among, uh, among the, the, uh, the rulers of Israel. Uh, the Seleucids themselves came to start appointing high priests in the temple, uh, some of whom had very questionable uh, connections at first to the, uh, to the, the priestly families, the, the proper priestly families of, uh, of ancient Israel. Uh, and you remember that, for example, the tribe of Levi was, was set aside by God as uh, the tribe uh, that, that would be, uh, that, that would sort of supply the priests uh, to the Lord. Uh, these were the ones who, who, would, uh, who would offer sacrifice to the, the Lord in the temple of various kinds. And once uh, a smaller section of Levites, namely the sons of Aaron, the brother of Moses, these were the ones who alone were able to uh, to enter into the Holy of Holies. Uh, these were the ones from whom could be taken uh, the high priests of the temple. <clears throat> Jonathan Maccabee, um, without really any any um, sort of definition of, of his pedigree in this regard, uh, has perhaps some some questionable uh, claim to to becoming the high priest. He seems to uh, to do the very same thing that the Seleucids were doing, which is to equate rulership of, of Israel with uh, with the priesthood of the temple. And I think there's there's something to that. All right, I think there's there's something uh, interesting about the the very the fact that uh, Christ uh, himself later on will uh, will uh, through the the evangelists will lay claim to the to the kingship of Israel. Uh, but whose claim to this kingship comes to its fruition, to its fulfillment, in his priestly sacrifice on the cross, his self-offering on the cross. Um, <clears throat> one of the, the more famous of the, the Hasmoneans, a guy named John Hyrcanus, uh, who's a nephew of, of Jonathan, uh, came to declare himself as well, later on, high priest, uh, while also being the king of, his, uh, king of Judea. Uh, and ten years later, he conquers. I guess uh, we may be missing some text here. Uh, he conquers Idumea, uh, which is uh, the the lands to the the south of Judah. Uh, he conquers Idumea and requires of all of the Idumeans uh, that they be circumcised. It requires of them that they become Jews, uh, essentially, and and most, if not all, of them submit. Um, this. Uh, as we alluded earlier, becomes rather important when it comes to uh, the, the fellow named Herod the Great. So uh, this guy, John Hyrcanus, um, is, uh, is, is a pretty crucial figure in the, in the development of, uh, of, of Second Temple Judea. Um, as I say, he's the, he's the nephew of, of Jonathan, the last of the Maccabean brothers. Um, in addition to, uh, to sort of uh, claiming the, the rights to uh, to, to offer sacrifices in the Jerusalem temple, uh, he does the very pious thing of going about and destroying the Samaritan temple uh, on Mount Gerizim in, in the year 129 BC. Um, this, of course, comes up uh, in, in vague allusions, in, uh, especially in the Gospel of John. Uh, in the year 125, he conquers, uh, uh, as I mentioned, Idumea and requires of them the wholesale conversion to Judaism. Um, he doesn't claim the, the title of king for himself, uh, but uh, he, he sort of uh, 
Curry's favor with uh, with the uh, with the Seleucids, uh, with the Ptolemies in Egypt, um, with with the other sort of Greek governors uh, by name by renaming all of his uh, all of his children with Greek names, and we begin to see now uh, with the Hasmoneans the uh, almost a, a kind of flowering of Greek influence uh, in the in the, the leadership of, of Judah. Um, presiding over the uh, kind of the the high point in uh, the the, uh, the sort of independence of the of the Judean kingdom uh, before the coming of the Romans uh, is this guy named uh, Alexander Yanai or Alexander Yanaeus, um, and he he actually does end up uh, claiming for himself the title of king. <clears throat> uh, but here we begin to see some of the uh, some of the ugliness with uh, with hereditary. Uh, royalty, especially, and even uh, hereditary priesthood. Uh, some of the uh, some of the descendants of, of the of the Maccabees uh, begin doing the same things as other kings of the world, uh, and basically carrying out political assassinations of family in order to make sure that uh, they secure their own claim to, to throne and, in this case, to altar as well. Um, <clears throat> Uh, Alexander does something rather controversial, and in this case, uh, kind of a, uh, a little bit of a foreshadowing of what will come along later on. Uh, he, he ends up uh, 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 let's see, yeah, he, uh, the, the purge of, of his brothers uh, was actually carried out by uh, by his father Hyrcanus, um, and he ends up marrying the widow of his brother Salome. Um, who uh, ends up a, a kind of a, an interesting figure in her own right. Uh, but Alexander Yanaeus, um, even as, a, as the high priest, and this kind of points up the, the way that the high priest and the kingship um, was, was a, a troublesome thing to, to have uh, sort of tightly knit uh, in, the, uh, in, in the, the period of Second Temple Judaism. Um, he came back from a, a rather bad defeat from, uh, from a, a battle with the Idumeans, and uh, sort of out of frustration, instead of performing the proper ceremony at the Feast of Tabernacles, uh, where he's supposed to take a, a, a pitcher of water and pour it over the altar, instead he pours it over his feet. Uh, and uh, with what significance we can, we can speculate, but at the very least this angered uh, a bunch of people that we uh, come to see in uh, much more prominence in the Gospels, a group of people known as the Pharisees. Uh, and the Pharisees were uh, this, this group of, of, uh, of uh, they, they were educated, but, uh, but they weren't necessarily wealthy or aristocratic. Uh, the, the Pharisees were, uh, be, became the chief critics, both of this particular Hasmonean king, as well as of the Hasmoneans more broadly. Hasmoneans in general, uh, in part because of the way that they treated the holy things of God uh, as if they were simply political tools, as if they were uh, uh, merely the, uh, the private privileges of, of, the, of this particular family, the Hasmoneans. Um, this, uh, this touches off a war, actually, with the Pharisees. The Pharisees uh, even go so far as to uh, contract the services of the Seleucids. They basically tell the Seleucids, you know, hey, you want back into, into Israel, we'll help you. Uh, and uh, this, this sort of war that, that, uh, that, that happens between uh, Alexander and the, and the Pharisees ends up with, uh, with 800 Pharisees being crucified in Jerusalem. Uh, so a, a, rather, a rather bloody time. Um, in fact, though, uh, the, it wasn't... Uh, simply military success that, that gave Alexander the victory here. In fact, it was his wife, uh, uh, Salome, Salome <laughs> Alexandra, uh, who's, who's known in, uh, in the Talmud as uh, Shlonsion uh, Hamalka, namely uh, the uh, Salome of, of Zion, the, the queen. Um, and she herself is, is uh, actually connected with the rebels. Her, her brother is one of the, uh, the Pharisee rebel leaders. Uh, and through sort of a, a long process of reconciliation, she's able to, to bring about a peace between the Pharisees and Alexander. <clears throat> uh, 
Alexander extends the, the borders of, of free Judea, of, of free Israel, so to speak, uh, to their farthest extent, uh, going all the way through the Decapolis, east of the Jordan, uh, as far north as Mount Hermon in Syria. Okay, so we're talking about beyond the Golan Heights. Uh, and south, all the way to Gaza and Nabatea. Uh, if you've ever heard of Petra, we're going to talk about Petra in a little bit. Uh, this is this is the land of the Nabataeans. Uh, Alexander Janaeus was a very successful general. He was a very successful commander, and uh, in this way, he was a very successful king. His main problems actually came from within, uh, with fighting with with armies without. He was he was very successful. He dies in the year seventy six, and interestingly, uh, instead of one of his sons immediately becoming uh, king, uh, his wife, who is uh, seen as uh, her, her name, uh, Shlom Sion, in fact, uh, is a, um, it's kind of a play on words. Her name is Salome. That's, that's just her name. Uh, but Shlom in, uh, in Hebrew, of course, means peace. And sh so she's considered actually the, the peacemaker of Sion, uh, Shlom Sion. Um, and so she, she enjoys such uh, popular support uh, uh, broadly, as well as in particular support from the Pharisees. Uh, that she, she's able to reign independently as queen for about nine years uh, until her own death. And it's during her reign, in fact, that she makes the Pharisees essentially the rulers of the Sanhedrin, rulers of the, uh, of, the, of the Jerusalem Council. And instead of making her son, Hyrcanus II, uh, king, he, uh, she appoints him as the high priest, uh, as uh, you know, if, if the if the Hasmoneans are, have a legitimate claim to uh, to the temple priesthood, he would uh, have a legitimate claim to, to uh, being made high priest. Uh, however, at her death, uh, Hyrcanus II gets back into the old ways of his own forefathers. Instead of just being a high priest, uh, he uh, he also claims for himself the, the title of king, uh, contested as so often happens by his own brother, a guy named Aristobulus. Uh, and this touches off another civil war. However, this civil war is not just one among many civil wars because uh, uh, rather recently, uh, there was a new neighbor in town just to the north, and that was the Romans. Uh, so this civil war, uh, of course, um, the Romans in general were, were pretty interested in uh, these, these different independent kingdoms having peace among themselves uh, because of course, if they have peace among themselves, they're able more or less to defend their own borders. They're, more, they're able more or less to, uh, to, to uh, especially provide a bulwark against uh, one of the, the major uh, threats uh, to the peace of Rome, and that is the Persians, uh, or as they've come to be known in these days, the Parthians. So uh, the Romans, uh, in general, anytime they find somebody fighting, Anytime they find the you know sort of fraternal infighting or civil wars or something like that, uh, they handle it with uh, the best Roman way that they know how, which is to bring in the army, uh, and that's uh, that's exactly what happens in uh, in this case. Uh, in 63 BC, uh, one of the the major generals, uh, a major aristocrat of uh, of the Roman army, a guy named Pompey the Great. Uh, he has already defeated Syria. He has already subdued Syria and made that a, a Roman province. Um, <clears throat> uh, this, uh, this high priest, Hyrcanus II, uh, was actually ready to concede defeat to his brother, Aristobulus, who was uh, a much stronger soldier. Um, but uh, in swoops this fellow named Antipater, the Idumean, who happens to have very good connections with and so with the help of uh, Pompey the Great and Antipater uh, the Idumean, Hyrcanus II is able to sort of reclaim his throne, uh, even though they, uh, they have to do a lot of damage in the process. Um, and in 63 BC, Pompey the Great uh, lays siege to Jerusalem, which uh, if you know anything about ancient warfare, laying siege to a place is always the prelude to very bad stuff. Uh, the, the bad stuff that, that happens afterwards, uh, thankfully, does, does not include the complete destruction of the temple. In fact, very little of the temple is touched. Um, the most offensive thing that happens in regard to the temple with Pompey the Great is that when he comes in, 
he insists on going into the Holy of Holies in order to see the God inside. And he's actually rather impressed that there is nothing in there. Uh, unlike, uh, unlike Roman uh, uh, temples, you know, you would go in and see a statue or something like that of, of various artistry. Um, and, and he's rather impressed that when he goes into the Holy of Holies, there's literally nothing there. Uh, there's no more Ark of the Covenant either. So, uh, Pompey, having uh, uh, helped uh, uh, Antipater and Hyrcanus uh, claim kingship of, of Israel in the year 63 BC, um, uh, he, he then appoints, or, or rather just sort of leaves uh, Antipater the, the Idumean uh, to be the unofficial ruler of uh, Jerusalem, of Judea, um, and appoints, formally appoints Hyrcanus the high priest. Uh, and in the process, he ends up uh, carving off many uh, of the territories which had been uh, a, a part of the United Judea under uh, Alexander Janaeus, and which are now uh, just, just being uh, given away as, as favors to his various generals and so forth. So uh, some of these areas include uh, places like the Decapolis, again, that's uh, the 10 cities uh, east of the Sea of Galilee, <clears throat> uh, various coastal cities, uh, as well as Samaria. Um, Antipater, uh, the Idumean, uh, again, very shrewd and very close with the Romans, uh, is around just in time when another rather famous Roman guy uh, needs assistance uh, because he has been caught in Egypt uh, amidst the, uh, the, the worries of many of his own enemies in Rome. Uh, and. Uh, who, are, who are helping the, uh, the Ptolemies to sort of reclaim their rule against what uh, Caesar seems to be doing, which is what he usually does when he goes to a place, taking, taking over. Um, <laughs> and uh, Antipater actually uh, sends aid to Julius Caesar. A very strange thing to do for uh, you know, a, a small little local kingdom, uh, the, the Nabataeans south of the Dead Sea, uh, to do for this growing imperial power you know, which is very hungry for money and soldiers and everything else. Um, you, can, you can see that Antipater uh, really imagines himself going places. Uh, and he kind of does. Uh, this, this works out for him more or less as he expects. Um, and uh, because of his sending uh, aid to Julius Caesar in Egypt, uh, and because uh, Caesar uh, uh, promptly defeats the Ptolemies, uh, including Cleopatra, uh, uh, in, in return, uh, in, in thanksgiving, Julius uh, Caesar, who has uh, now been named dictator for life by the Roman Senate, officially names uh, Antipater the first Roman procurator of Judea and Galilee. Uh, that's a title that's not going to remain for very long because uh, uh, Antipater, uh, of course, has uh, ridden the wave of Julius Caesar about as far as it goes, because in four years' time, Julius Caesar himself is on the outs and uh, is assassinated in the Roman Forum. Um, uh, in the time when, uh, when Antipater has a formal appointment as, as procurator, he himself appoints as governor of Galilea and Perea. Uh, Galilee, of course, is, uh, is well known as the, the northern country of, uh, of the, the land of Israel. And Perea is uh, the region just east of the Jordan River uh, between the Sea of Galilee and the Dead Sea. Uh, so his son, uh, named Herod, or at, at least the, the Greek form that we've, we've come to know him by, is Herod. Uh, his, his Hebrew name was actually Hordos. Um, he, he comes to be uh, the governor of Galilee and Perea. Um, he has uh, problems, though, uh, and among these problems are the fact, as we mentioned earlier, he is an Idumean, right? He is not a Hasmonean. The Hasmoneans are still around. Uh, the Hasmoneans, uh, uh, this, this uh, aristocratic family, uh, uh, have... Uh, still descendants through John Hyrcanus II and uh, his extended family. And uh, one of them, a guy named Antigonus, uh, of course, uh, 
doesn't appreciate the uh, the way that that Herod is just sort of sliding into into kingship in Judea, even though he was his appointment was simply for Galilee and Perea, uh, until Antipater dies in 43. In the year 40, this guy Antigonus, the, the Hasmonean, uh, again like one of his uh, one of his old ancestors, uh, invites the Parthians in uh, to come and overthrow uh, the Herods uh, and and to overthrow the Romans. Um, remember, the Romans want peace. They want uh, they want places, especially to uh, to be strong, to act as a bulwark uh, against anybody who's going to make trouble, but especially the Parthians, okay? Uh, because the Parthians are at, at this point basically the, the great nemesis of the Romans. <clears throat> um, Antigonus is at first successful. Uh, the Parthians do succeed in uh, laying siege to Jerusalem, and uh, Herod actually has to flee. Um, with Herod's help and with the Romans' help, he is able to uh, return in the year 37, and uh, they are able to reconquer Jerusalem, and Herod is once again installed uh, as king of the Jews. Uh, he, he acquires this title, in fact, directly from the Roman Senate. Um, his... Uh, Father's friend, uh, Mark Antony, uh, is the one who obtains, who, who becomes his friend, and, and he obtains his support before the Roman Senate. He becomes king of the Jews. Um, in order to, uh, and, and this uh, is, is our sort of connection to all of the things we've talked about so far with regard to the Hasmoneans, in order to, uh, in a, in a, uh, as, as real a way as he can, Herod the Idumean. Uh, uh, become Herod the Hasmonean, he marries uh, one of the, the last uh, survivors of the, of the Hasmonean household, uh, a woman named Mariamne. Uh, Mariamne, uh, who comes to be known as Mariamne I because uh, Herod ends up with multiple wives, um, Mariamne uh, is the one who, uh, she's, there, there's, there's, it, it's almost a kind of Antony and Cleopatra scene between Herod and Mariamne. It's a political alliance, it's a political uh, uh, marriage, uh, but, but Herod is basically head over, in, head over heels in love with Mariamne. Uh, incredibly jealous of her, in fact, as well. Um, when, at one point, uh, later on, he, uh, in fact, after Mark Antony uh, ends up uh, committing suicide with uh, Cleopatra in Alexandria, <clears throat> Um, uh, Herod has to go quickly and make peace with uh, what, what could very well be his own nemesis, uh, Octavian Augustus. Mm -hmm. And so he leaves instructions behind uh, because, uh, and this is, this is as the story goes anyway, uh, he leaves instructions behind because he would not want his, uh, his, his darling wife to have to live the, uh, uh, the rest of her life without him. That if he goes to see Octavian Augustus and doesn't return, uh, that somebody is supposed to do her the favor of killing <laughs> The hardest part about this, though, is when she finds out. <laughs> Ouch. <laughs> so, uh, Mariamne, uh, this is one of the reasons she's Mariamne the first, um, she, uh, she ends up sort of putting basically as much distance as uh, a ruling queen can uh, from her uh, husband king when he does in fact return. Um, and he takes this amiss. He is, he is not happy about this at all. Um, thinks that there is something going on. Uh, and uh, in the process thinks not only of course that there's something going on between her uh, and uh, the guy that he had told to make sure that she dies, who obviously is the one who let the cat out of the bag, uh, but, uh, but also, uh, th that would be treason enough, of course, because if she's his ticket to becoming a Hasmonean, uh, this, is, uh, this, is, this is bad enough, but uh, uh, he also ends up coming to suspect that she is plotting against him. Um, and uh, there, are, there are a few examples in ancient history of wives you know, managing to slip something into uh, the king's dinner and so forth uh, to you know, end whatever horror they were having to live. 
So, uh, whether correctly or not, Herod believes that this is about to happen. And uh, what was at, at first, you know, this, this sort of devoted, jealous love of his wife ends up naturally turning to hatred, um, and he has her executed. Um, there's, a, there's another story, a strange story, I think, that appears in the Talmud, um, that he actually had her uh, encased in honey. Um, oh. In what? Uh, honey. honey. Uh, bees. Honey. Oh. Uh, I don't think because, you know, he always wanted to remember who this is honey. But I, I, uh, supposedly because this, uh, because, because honey, of course, is is known to have this, this kind of immortal uh, lifespan, right? And so... He kills her and then encases her in honey so her body will corrupt. Will not corrupt. Oh, oh, that's really twisted. It's, uh, it's, as, as my old church history professor used to say, if it's not true, it should be. Uh, and, uh, and, you know, uh, Harris, Harris does a lot of crazy things, so it's really not out of character for him. Uh, this is, this is quite possibly the sort of thing he would do. It should be mentioned, however, that the, the Talmud is, is the product of, uh, of, of the, the, the Jewish rabbi centuries after uh, the events that they narrate in this case. Um, and uh, uh, the rabbis, the rabbinic movement, is itself a kind of offshoot of uh, the Pharisaic movement, of the, of the, uh, the, the group of Pharisees. And Herod uh, was not liked by the Pharisees. So uh, there, there may be a little bit of exaggeration there. Uh, <laughs> Maybe it wasn't honey, maybe it was, you know, <laughs> but, uh, at the very least. Uh, that's the story, so that's what I'm telling you. <clears throat> Herod uh, was, uh, was not just uh, crazy, though. Uh, he, he actually, he, he, was, he was rather prolific in his, uh, in his uh, building campaigns. Uh, some of the more famous ones are actually still there to be seen. They're still uh, around to, uh, to be toured. Uh, these days. Uh, one of the places you've probably heard of, Masada, um, was a fortress that had been built by one of the, the Hasmonean princes. Um, and although they, they don't really find much evidence of, of the old Hasmonean structure, uh, they, there is evidence of, of Herod's structure. It is, it is still there. Uh, at least the foundations of it before the Romans got to it later on. <clears throat> Uh, he famously built up uh, winter palaces in Jericho. These were uh, places that he uh, would, would often uh, revert to uh, when he just needed some R&R. &R. Uh, the one in the picture here is uh, one that I've become more interested in lately since they've uh, been doing more and more architectural digs on it, or, or rather um, archaeological digs on it. Uh, this place called Macarus, um, which is in Jordan. And it's, uh, it's actually the place where most scholars think that John the Baptist was beheaded. Um, so this, uh, this, this uh, fortress uh, was, was built up by Herod the Great, and it's actually in the territory that would have been inherited by his son, Herod Antipas. And Herod Antipas, as we'll see, is the one who is actually responsible for the beheading of John the Baptist. <clears throat> um, there, uh, was also a massive building campaign that he undertook uh, on behalf of uh, you know, his, his loyalty to the Roman government, uh, especially to the Roman Emperor Caesar Augustus. Um, he builds uh, this city, which was, which was on the, uh, the ruins of the former city of Samaria. He builds the city of Sebast. Uh, and Sebast uh, continues even, even through the uh, even through the, uh, the, the the Jewish wars uh, later in, in uh, the first century, uh, it continues to be a, a fairly major city uh, going forward. A lot of the cities that survived uh, the uh, the Jewish wars uh, of the uh, uh, of the first century um, were cities that had been built by Herod or had been built uh, sort of on a Greek plan, if you will. So. Uh, he, he undertakes the building of this city uh, of Sebast in Samaria, uh, but probably uh, one of his, his second most famous one uh, is the building of this uh, port city 
uh, which comes to be the capital city for uh, the ruling Romans later on, Caesarea Maritima. Uh, and Caesarea, Caesarea Maritima would be sort of the full name, but most people just refer to it as Caesarea. Uh, and this Caesarea on the, on the northern coast of, of uh, Samaria, on the Mediterranean, is kind of the gateway for the Romans. Uh, and uh, this would have been very, very welcome by uh, Caesar Augustus as a, as a way of, of keeping the, the sort of supply lines open uh, between Egypt, uh, the, they, they needed land routes as well as sea routes between Egypt and Rome because uh, with, uh, with access to Egypt, they had access to what was known as the bread basket of the Mediterranean. Uh, Egypt uh, far and away produced uh, more grain than pretty much any, any other area of the empire. Uh, so this is one of the reasons that uh, for uh, the, uh, the Judean territory becomes as important to the Romans as it is uh, because it's, it's keeping uh, both the, the people fed, but more importantly, it's keeping the army fed. Uh, this, is, this is how the, the, the Roman machine runs. Um, and finally, uh, uh, Herod's perhaps crowning achievements in the way of building are actually take place in Jerusalem itself. He famously uh, uh, expands the temple. Oftentimes when we refer to uh, Herod's temple or, or, or the uh, the temple being built by Herod, uh, it wasn't it wasn't actually that the temple itself was being uh, rebuilt by Herod because, it, as I mentioned before, it wasn't actually destroyed by Pompey earlier uh, in his conquest. Uh, what what Herod managed to do was expand it to expand the, uh, the the porticos and so forth outside the temple, uh, and even to uh, to sort of ground these foundations better. He built huge walls, uh, but these walls were really just they they were retaining walls. Uh, they weren't the walls of the of the temple structure itself. So when you go to Jerusalem these days, uh, and you go to the only remaining wall of the temple, uh, of course the wall that you're seeing in that case is uh, is one of these retaining walls. It's not the it's not the actual wall of the of the temple building itself. Um, <clears throat> but that that would have been one of the walls that was uh, that was built in the time of Herod. Uh, probably in about the middle of his, his reign. And then finally, uh, the, the Herodian fortress, the Herodion. Um, it was, Herod was probably the most proud of this one, I think just because of its beauty in the, in the landscape. It's not very far southeast of Jerusalem. Uh, and that's where he requested to, to be buried. And many scholars today think that that is actually the final resting place of Herod the Great, uh, even, though he, uh, even though he died in Jerusalem. Uh, and you want to talk about crazy stories about his death. I, I don't have time to go into them, but, but uh, there, there are crazy stories around the death of Herod the Great, too. So, um, but Herod was very anxious for uh, his legacy. He wanted to make sure that uh, you know, somebody who was, who was sort of loyal to his vision, loyal to Romans, loyal uh, to, to peace in Israel, would come into uh, his power, would, would, uh, would enter his throne. And so as I mentioned earlier, uh, one of the things he did to ensure this was to try and eliminate those who would uh, cause his demise before his time, including his wife, Mary Ann the First. Uh, incidentally, he also executes her mother, uh, her mother, his mother-in-law, uh, because, you know, uh, she may have been a part of that plot. Uh, he goes on to marry uh, three more brides. Mary Ann the First was actually his second wife. And he marries three more, Mary II, um, who is the mother of Herod Philip. And he's going to be uh, a key figure for, for getting us to where we are in the beheading of John the Baptist. <clears throat> um, and Mary II's father, uh, and, and as well as uh, his daughter, are both from Egypt. They're both uh, Alexandrian, uh, Alexandrian Jews. And... Uh, as a favor for sort of uh, uh, the, the basically al allowing his daughter to marry the guy who just killed his earlier wife, <laughs> uh, Herod is able to broker uh, that he will give to her father uh, the high priesthood in Jerusalem. Uh, so this guy named Simon Bathus or Simon uh, Boethus. Uh, 
Um, <clears throat> and he, he ends up remaining as high priest for a couple of decades. Uh, his, his fourth wife, uh, Malfagi, um, bears him uh, two of the, the major Herods who will come uh, onto the scene later on. Uh, Herod Archelaus and Herod Antipas. Uh, Malfaki, it's, it's worth noting, was actually a Samaritan, uh, and he married her uh, in Samaria the same way that he had married uh, Mary Ammi I in Samaria, uh, back before he was able to take back Jerusalem. Uh, and then finally, Cleopatra of Jerusalem, uh, to distinguish her from Cleopatra of Egypt, uh, who is the mother of Philip. And uh, this Philip, I'll, I'll just mention this here. This Philip is uh, confused with uh, the other Philip that we mentioned earlier, as many of the Herods are confused with each other. Um, uh, this, this Philip, who is the son of Cleopatra of Jerusalem, uh, is not the Philip who is referred to in the Gospel as the husband of Herodias. Okay? The husband of Herodias is actually Herod Philip, about whom not much is actually else. So uh, that's to help situate us a little bit here. Uh, and genealogies, this is always the fun part, right? It's, it's figuring out whose who's, uh, mother and whose father is whose. And uh, especially when you get into these very tricky marriages, that's another whole story. So um, <clears throat> the. Uh, the, the drama continues for Herod even after the execution of his wife, Mary Um because, of course, this kind of raises the hackles of some of his own sons. Uh, and, uh, you know, uh, Mary Amni ended up bearing Herod two sons uh, who were, uh, until this point, would have been first in line for the succession um, because Mary Amni being Hasmonean, uh, gives th uh, to them the greater legitimacy, the greater claim to the uh, throne of Jerusalem. Um, they, they rightly expected that they would become their father's successors. Um, well, of course, because uh, they are looking forward to this, uh, and at first Herod uh, is, is prepared to sort of welcome them into this role, uh, is, is pleased to, to see sort of a line of Herods becoming Hasmonean. Um, he, his, his, uh, Excitement over this uh, begins to turn to uh, doubt and then to uh, paranoia. And uh, he sees that they are, uh, in fact, um, he, he begins to think of them as plotting against him as well. And uh, first has them tried for treason before Octavian Augustus. Uh, unsuccessfully, uh, Augustus wants things to remain as smooth and uh, as to be expected as possible. <clears throat> but Herod is unsatisfied with this five years later and ends up executing both of those sons. Uh, the same fate awaits his older son uh, from his first wife, uh, who doesn't appear very prominently named Doris, um, and, she, and uh, his first son, Antipater, ends up uh, being tried for treason and executed as well. Uh, he names Herod Antipas as his successor to become king of the Jews, um, and uh, as one of the final sort of uh, frustrations of his life in his attempt to please the Romans, uh, he erects a Roman eagle, uh, which uh, you may know is a, a sacred image for the, for the Roman gods. He erects a Roman eagle above the door of the temple. Uh, and uh, a group of, of sort of young zealots led by the Pharisees uh, uh, forcibly removes it. So this is, this is kind of the, uh, the end of Herod the Great. Uh, he does die in 4 BC. He divides his kingdom into tetrarchies, four regions. It's really three main regions and one small portion left to his sister, Salome. Uh, the three main regions are left to, uh, in his will, which Herod Antipas finds out after his death, uh, that Herod Antipas is not, in fact, to become king of the Jews. Uh, that instead, it is now reverted to Archelaus, uh, Herod Archelaus. Um, the Romans are the ones who adjudicate this will, and the Romans uh, are, are satisfied with naming Arch Archelaus as ethnarch of Judea, Samaria, and Idumea, um, not king. Uh, uh, 
uh, Herod Antipas becomes the, uh, the tetrarch of Galilee and Perea. Uh, that's the purple portions there. The red portion is Archelaus. <clears throat> Um, and then uh, Philip, the, the son of, uh, of, of Cleopatra of Jerusalem, uh, he ends up being accorded these regions to the northeast, uh, in fact, closer to the Roman legions uh, who occupied Syria, uh, Iterae and Batanea and uh, Galonitis, which is where we get the term Golan Heights. So <clears throat> Archelaus was a terrible ethnarch. Uh, the Romans are done with him in the years. Uh, in 6 AD, um, but uh, Antipas and Philip are able to keep their territories. Uh, and here we come to the uh, sort of the end of the story anyway, or the, the, the end of the line uh, of our genealogy. Uh, we finally arrive at, at Herod Antipas, uh, who is the once and future king, maybe, he hopes. Uh, <laughs> he was supposed to be king, he was promised that he would become king of the Jews uh, at his father's death, uh, his will said otherwise. Um, however, he has this hope because what are the territories that he's made governor of? The very same territories that his father was made governor of before he became king. So he plays his cards right. He might end up where he's where he's hoping to. Um, <clears throat> uh, in order to uh, uh, sort of solidify his uh, his claim uh, before the Romans, in order to impress the Romans. Uh, he marries uh, a Nabataean princess named Phasaelis, who is uh, the daughter of, of King Aretas IV, uh, of Petra fame, uh, because uh, you, you may have heard of the, the Petra treasury. It's one of the most famous, uh, I should have had a picture here, but alas. Uh, uh, the, uh, king Aretas IV is one of the most powerful kings of the Nabataean kingdom, and uh, many, many of the features that you can even see in Petra today date to his time. So uh, initially he marries this uh, this Phasaelis, um, but later on, while on a visit in Rome, falls in love with his brother's wife, uh, Herodias. Um, and there's no exact date for this, I'm, I'm estimating it somewhere around the year 10 AD. Um, Herodias uh, is, in fact, of Hasmonean ancestry. She is uh, the daughter of one of the sons of Herod the Great that he killed. Um, and she has been married to her half-uncle already. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Herod Philip. Uh, so Herod Philip has married his niece, uh, which uh, whether Herod Philip was excited about that or not, uh, to, uh, to, to marry a Hasmonean at this time would have been uh, would have been something of a gift. So uh, she, however, sees that that Herod Philip is going nowhere uh, because he's been written out of the will by Herod the Great already. Um, this may contribute something of the swiftness with which she falls in love with somebody other than her husband. <laughs> um, and uh, she has already uh, born Herod Philip, a daughter named Salome. <clears throat> So Salome is not actually uh, Herod Antipas' own daughter, it's his stepdaughter. Um, yeah. So uh, Herod Antipas, after this, uh, this tryst in Rome with Herodias, uh, ends up uh, divorcing his wife Phasaelis, angering King Aretas of the Nabataeans, causing a war, loses the war, um, has to, to pay massive amounts to the Nabataeans uh, and ends up um, basically on the outs with the Romans now um, and uh, opens himself to uh, various accusations and so forth that land both him and Herodias in exile. And uh, they both die very shortly after they end up in exile. <clears throat> so uh, what happens to Salome? Actually, she ends up marrying her Half uncle Philip, um, and uh, uh, he dies within a couple of years, uh, childless, and so she's then married to her cousin Agrippa. Uh, that Herod Agrippa that I mentioned earlier, who's one of the other Herods, uh, the one who uh, actually causes the death of James, the brother of the Lord, in the Acts of the Apostles. That 
So, themes, connections. Uh, we've talked about a lot. We've talked a lot about a fa family matters, but also some themes, also some, uh, some things connected with the temple, with the kingship, uh, with the legitimacy of one's kingship. Uh, and especially of the, of the way that this uh, kingship seems to, at, at different times, sort of uh, rise and fall with, uh, with or, or, or by the Romans, and at other times seems to be in competition with the Romans. Uh, I mentioned that, that position of procurator that, uh, that was given at first to, uh, to Antipater the Idumean, father of Herod the Great. Um, <clears throat> after Archelaus, uh, ends up sort of proving his ineptitude at being the, the ruler of Judea. Uh, the Romans then appoint a governor, uh, a prefect of Judea, whose name is Quirinius. And you probably remember Quirinius uh, from, the, from the Gospel of Luke. He's the one who announces the census that causes the Holy Family to have to, uh, to, to go to Bethlehem. Uh, at least uh, in, in some tellings of the story. The, the histories. Uh, they, they don't exactly fit quite together like a puzzle, um, and some of these will be just uh, things that we will only come to see the resolutions of, uh, perhaps at the end of time. But uh, you can see, uh, just by way of conclusion, why uh, a prophet like John the Baptist arriving on the scene, saying that uh, Herod Antipas is wrong to take the wife of his half-brother, even though it's been done multiple times before him. Um, and uh, that, that doing so is, uh, uh, is, is, is basically offensive to God. It's offensive to the, uh, to the, uh, to the, to the law of God. Um, it's a strange thing uh, that this should be the thing that lands John the Baptist in prison and then beheaded. Um, but in the, uh, in, in, the, in the end of the story here, you can see that it, it really wasn't just, um, it really wasn't just indignation on the part of Herodias uh, that ended up uh, making the, the request of her daughter at, at Herod's uh, intemperate offer uh, that, that she requests the head of John the Baptist. Um, it was it was it was a uh, it was a uh, it was an act of of, of uh, safety. It was, it was an act of, of ambition. Uh, she herself perhaps uh, saw herself becoming like her own ancestor, um, Shlom Sion uh, Hamalka, um, and. Uh, or, or even uh, her own uh, grandmother, Mary uh, the I. Um, so the, the kinds of ambition that ended up leading to uh, the, the, the sort of tragic death of, of John the Baptist, his beheading, and dramatic death of John the Baptist in true Herodian style, uh, there, there is a, there's a there's sort of long background to all of these things. Uh, but that, that long background, I, I think, uh, helps color in a good bit of a lot of the drama that goes on in the Gospels, especially around um, who is who is king, who is a real friend of Caesar, uh, what it is uh, to uh, to be uh, popular with the people, uh, as the as the Pharisees saw their own fortunes rise on popularity with the people. And this, by the way, is one of the more interesting things uh, that I, I find, and I'll end it here. Uh, the Pharisees are often considered to be this uh, this great sort of boogeyman mm -hmm. um, because of their their conflicts with the apostles, especially after the resurrection of Jesus. Mm -hmm. But uh, but sort of in the in the grander scheme of things, there was probably nobody closer to uh, to uh, the people whom Christ clearly values in the Gospels, the people from whom the the apostles themselves come. Uh, and the, uh, the, the, the direction of, of the, the teachings of Jesus, then the Pharisees. Uh, the Pharisees themselves, uh, Jesus will say, uh, have actually claimed for themselves the seat of Moses, and uh, uh, properly so. 
Uh, the problem that Jesus has with the Pharisees is not the things that they say, uh, it's, the, it's the things that they do, or, or even more the things that they don't do. So I'd like to end it there, and uh, I realize I have uh, talked for way too long, so you, uh, if you had questions, you probably forgot them already, but uh, if, you, if you have any questions that you haven't forgotten, I'll be, or, or even comments, uh, I'll be happy to take them on. Yes, please. Yeah, so uh, the, um, uh, the, Mac the Maccabees, uh, so they didn't have any Levitical blood in them, right? That, they were probably Judah, tribe of Judah. It's, it's unknown. Uh, so it, so that seems pretty, uh, you know, a lot of hootspot <laughs> there <laughs> to claim uh, the priesthood. Exactly. And, yeah. and it seems if you, if you have a claim to the one, you more or less give up your claim to the other. Right. right? And so so if, they, if they are a high priestly clan, if they are of the of, of a Levitical, Levitical family, then they are not the sons of David. So and then these other uh, so these other appointees obviously they probably weren't Levitical either. Uh, so that leads me to the question: uh, What about uh, uh, Annas and Caiaphas? Were they uh, Levites? I, I really wanted to talk more about Annas and Caiaphas, but at uh, at eighteen slides I thought I just can't do this. Uh, but but Annas and Caiaphas um, again, it's it's not very well known. A lot of a lot of the sort of documentation of priestly pedigree. Uh, after the exile uh, is not very well known. Um, and it does seem to be the case that uh, you, you, could have a very, you could have a pretty thin claim uh, in terms of your family origins, um, but the thing that would, would really secure your claim uh, to the high priesthood, uh, starting with the, the end of the Seleucids, uh, was any any kind of wealth or or social power, social prowess. Mm -hmm. And if you had that kind of aristocratic connections and so forth, then yeah, you you would probably get yourself named uh, huh. high priest. So in other words, is, is, is priest has thought you really get stopped being a vocation among Yes. You need not really because they can really have priesthood. Yes. There, so God is a political appointment degree. And it, and it had stopped being an inheritance. Right? Mm -hmm. and it, it had stopped being something that uh, that in fact was was the inheritance of uh, of the Lord's own making. Um, throughout the Psalms, you hear this: uh, the, the priests themselves will always say, "You are my inheritance." Mm -hmm. um, well, by the time we get to the uh, the high priests of the first century B.C. and A.D., uh, those those priests clearly have more. Inheritance <laughs> than the Lord. Um, their, 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 their inheritance, in fact, uh, in, in terms of worldly wealth, is precisely what gives them uh, access to the Holy of Holies. So it's really interesting then, but then a high priest like Nicodemus and things like that, I mean, how did they come into their priesthood and how was that different for them from the high priests who obviously were so corrupt so that they could see? Were they, how did they? Get their appointment, so you know, since they obviously had a heart that could see Christ, right? Uh, and that, I mean, the the thing I, I usually return to is that um, in the uh, in the Acts of the Apostles, when uh, when Saint Luke is, is narrating the the initial uh, success of the of the the apostles preaching, <clears throat> he'll say like. 3,000 were added to the Lord that day. There was peace in, uh, in the city and so forth. And, the, and the, one of the last things he punctuates all of this litany of successes with is, and even some priests were becoming faithful to the Lord. <laughs> it's, a, it's a beautiful line. <laughs> uh, but the, but the, uh, the, there, there were many priests uh, in, in Jerusalem at the time, um, and some of them, like uh, Zechariah, the father of John the Baptist, would have been faithful. Yeah, because, um, because that was my question: like, were there? You know, we know were there how many faithful priests were they? Were they all appointed? Right. No, it's it's it seems just a high priest. So the high priest uh, would, have, would have been the one um, who, yeah, he, he may have been slotted in as 
as kind of the, the guarantor of, of the king's own interests uh, in, the, in the, the royal holy city. Yeah, sure. Um, I just wondered what the, where, what the sources were for all of this. Yeah. I mean, um, Roman <laughs> history is great. I mean, uh, Jewish history. You said the Talmud. Uh, yeah, there's one, there's one main guy for a lot of Josephus? this. Josephus? Josephus. Is that who it is? That's yeah. what I, I So, was so if you want to read Jewish antiquities and the Jewish wars, yeah. uh, all 900 pages of them. Uh, <laughs> Uh, there's I this, like your distillation better. <laughs> there's, there's, there's a lot more detail, uh, and, and in some ways a lot more graphic detail. He's, he, he seems to know all of the, the skinny, all of the okay. gospel. Oh, well, it's like one of those histories that's actually awesome to read, yeah. like Herodotus. Yeah. Like, it's actually interesting. He tells you, you all the stories, it. exactly. <laughs> Josephus is great, especially if you want to see Jesus from an outsider's point of view, because Jesus is in Josephus, and it's so cool. Yeah, it's awesome. And he's, you know, uh, he, he makes he makes an appearance, so to speak. But the one that uh, that Josephus is really impressed with is John the Baptist. Mm -hmm. And he, he, he devotes quite a bit of material to him. Question. Real quick, the whole thing with Ptolemy would that be found in Josephus? Yes. Uh, because uh, the, the the Ptolemies and the Seleucids um, <clears throat> they were at various times invading each other's countries all the time. So uh, it, it all depended on you know which general saw which opportunity to try and invade and increase their their ranks. I'm just impressed with the fact that he went into the Holy Holies and said, I don't think Jupiter is right. I can't. <laughs> I think oh, that there's something here. Yeah, Pompey. Pompey the Pompey. Yeah, I'm sorry, Pompey, yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Yes. Can I have one more now that you brought the name of Pompey up? Um, so since both Caesar and uh, Julius Caesar and Pompey were both sort of either played on or, you know, worked with or however you want to say it, was that part of the contention between them that these tribes or these leaders um, were, they were both working with different groups, or what? You know, that, that's, that's an interesting question, whether, uh, whether Caesar made his, uh, his trek to Egypt uh, in order to, um, you know, limit any growing power that Pompey might have from Syria. Mm -hmm. so that's a very good question. Mm -hmm. uh, and I, I probably should know the answer to that, but um, yeah, I I would I would be interested to go through some Tacitus to see what he has to say about that. Uh, uh, yeah, I I I do know that uh, that Mark Antony when uh, when he needed to sort of make an excuse to uh, the Senate for his continuing activities in Egypt, uh -huh. it was that he was carrying on uh, you know the sort of will and wishes of Caesar. Oh, okay. and, and it was it was something that he he says that Caesar intended to do was, was just essentially annex Egypt, um, so that they wouldn't have to rely on the Ptolemies. They wouldn't have to rely on treaties. Uh, the Ptolemies were uh, they were they were pretty efficient at, at many things, but militarily they were they were not that good. At least by the time. What would be the function of a divorce in this type of environment? Because it would seem to me that if the first wife uh, wasn't very uh, useful anymore, they would just add another wife or perhaps execute the other one. So is there, is there actually like a divorce? I mean, like there is today where it's say go go somewhere and here's some money and property or something. Yeah, yeah. That's that's actually a great question. Um, and it, it seems that, you know, you would only, as you say, you would only do it if you had to. At the, at the time of the of the Lord, it's it's often assumed uh, that simply because there were examples of the patriarchs having multiple wives mm -hmm. uh, engaging in polygamy, uh, that therefore this was just a commonplace thing. Um, but his, historians, I think, tell us that at least among the Jews, it was not. Mm -hmm. uh, at least among the Jews, uh, monogamy was still the norm. Mm -hmm. So when um, uh, yeah. 
a, uh, I'm trying to think, and, and even divorce uh, was actually something that was, uh, it was, it was pretty frowned upon um, as, as a, um, as just a sort of tool of expedience, um, which is one of the reasons that the question comes to the, uh, to the Lord in the way that it does, whether a man may divorce his wife for any reason. Um, and this was perhaps a very live issue with Herod Antipas on one hand and Herodias on the other hand. Um, and, and Josephus takes particular offense to Herodias uh, uh, because she was the one who actually, who, who it seems, uh, initiated the divorce with Herod Philip, which at least in Mosaic law was unheard of. Uh, it was the man who issued a bill of divorce to his wife, allowing her to remarry. Basically, it was, it was considered a favor to give her a divorce, because then she could remarry. Uh, it, so so the, to, to kind of come around about to your question, it, it would probably be in the case where, like, you know, the, the husband or king in question had just decided, I'm, I'm not going to take care of you anymore. But here's a divorce, so you can have this baby. So if you don't, if you if you like them, you divorce them. If you hate them, you kill them. Uh, yeah. <laughs> unless you unless you really love them so so much that uh, <laughs> you're going to put them in hiding. <laughs> <laughs> we can still go up to her and say, "Hi, honey." <laughs> <laughs> that, that would be the, the archaeological find of the century. Is we have to find Mary Anne's tomb. <laughs> uh, and, uh, like a little Han Solo moment. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. All right. Well, why don't we close in prayer? Okay. Just make sure. Uh, I know Ren will tell you, and I will add my own uh, encouragement. Please eat all of the things. Uh, <laughs> all of the things. Let's close in prayer in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end.